ample honorarium. As local church communities, we are to care for the economic needs of faithful men and women who have been appointed to serve us. Here's Gene. At the close of this letter, Paul used a, a very practical situation to encourage the believers in Crete to practice this principle. And here we have the practical situation, which is described in Titus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. And it involves two people, uh, a man by the name of Zenos, a man by the name of Paulus. And it relates to meeting their economic needs. So let's read it. What does it say? Paul said to Titus, diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey so that they will lack nothing. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works for pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. Now let me unpack that uh, just a bit so that we understand why Paul addressed this issue right here at the end of the letter. Well, first of all, these two men evidently delivered the letter to Titus. They came to Crete because Paul left Titus in Crete to set in order everything we've just been reading about. And so Paul said, they're servants of the Lord and they have needs. Now, Zenos the lawyer we know very little about. Some believe that he was a Gentile, a pagan, uh, before he became a Christian and was a lawyer within the Roman culture. Some believe that he was a Jew and uh, that was a rabbi, and of course the rabbis were called lawyers. Uh, Jesus called them lawyers because they were supposed to interpret the Old Testament law. Regardless of who he was, he had come to Christ and he was serving Christ, and he was devoting a lot of his time to uh, helping Paul carry out his mission, and that is to reach the Gentile world. Now, Apollos we know a lot about. He was uh, a Jewish convert. Uh, he was a very educated man. Uh, his background in, in religious studies and Greek studies and Roman studies are, are very obvious, and he became a great spiritual leader to help the Apostle Paul. And here are these two men. And what Paul is saying is be sure uh, to help them on their journey. They, they've come to you. Now they have uh, some uh, economic needs. And uh, Titus, make sure that they're taken care of financially. Bread on their tables, clothes on their backs, shoes on their feet, very practical needs. But then I like what Paul said here because it correlates with another saying, saying I think he wrote to the Philippians when they helped him when he was in prison, and it was this. He says, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works for pressing needs. What is he talking about? That as believers who are ministered to by these people, we should help them through good works for their pressing needs, their economic needs. And then he says, so they will not be unfruitful. And it just hit me as I was reviewing this, that correlates what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians when he was in jail and he received a gift. He said to them in chapter 4 Philippians, it's not that I want the gift per se, it's that I want to build your bank account in heaven. Remember when he said that? That they will have good works recorded in heaven because they've helped Paul communicate the gospel. He's saying the same thing here, I think, when he wrote to them, to Titus, and then to the church, so that they will not be unfruitful. What is the fruit? It's eternal rewards that we will receive for being generous and helping God's people carry out the work of the Lord. And you know what we'll do with those eternal rewards. We'll spend eternity laying them at the feet of Jesus, not just for ourselves. But we have fruitfulness in order to worship God through eternity. And I love that. Now, um, here, here's what happened in essence, an explanation. Zenos and Apollos came to Crete during the time Titus was establishing the churches. It appears they delivered Paul's letter to Titus. 
in which Paul instructed Titus to make sure that their material needs were met so these two men could continue their missionary journey. Makes sense. They had no other source of income. To carry out this goal, Titus was to share this need with the believers in Crete so they could care for these men, both while they were there in Crete and after they left. Now, there's another significant reason why Paul wrote these words. Because at that time in Crete, there were false prophets who were only doing what they did for money. And he wanted to endorse these two men. They were not like these false prophets. And what did Paul say about these false prophets? Right in the beginning, and I'll review this, Titus 1, 10 to 11. For there are many rebellious people full of empty talk and deception. He's saying that's, that's not Apollos. Uh, that, that is not Zenos. Especially those from the circumcision party. Both of these men may have been Jews. We're not sure. It is necessary to silence them, that is, these false prophets. They are ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't. Why? In order to get money dishonestly. So here come two men delivering this letter. They have phys physical needs. What are the suspicions because of their experience? And Paul wanted to make sure that they knew this does not, this statement about false prophets does not apply to Zenos and Apollos. Rather, they had absolutely pure motives. And Paul is defending that, endorsing them. And that's why endorsements are very important. Because obviously people do at times like trust because if you look at what's going on in our world today, there are many false prophets out there that are only in it for the money. And that makes people skittish in terms of who do you trust? And we all need endorsements. People of God need endorsements. But that should not keep us from, not, from doing God's will when it comes to helping people. Here's another illustration. I love this one. It's another commendation. And it relates to a woman by the name of Phoebe. And this is what Paul wrote at the end of his letter to the Romans. And it's interesting he wrote this at the end of the letter, just like his letter to Titus. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church in Zancrea. That's right close, by the way, to Corinth, the city of Corinth. So you should welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever matter she may require your help. Now she's in Rome. He goes on to say, For indeed she has been a benefactor of many and of me also, and there are many who believe that she was the woman that delivered Paul's letter all the way from Sincrea all the way to Rome, to the Roman Christians. Can you imagine this woman on her own making this trip, carrying what eventually became one of the most significant books of the New Testament? She had no idea probably what she had, but Paul entrusted her with that, and he endorsed her and said to the Roman believers, take care of her. She's a godly woman, and she des deserves your help. So we have a, an interesting illustration. Now, Paul extends this uh, concept of remuneration when he wrote to, um, to Timothy, who was in Ephesus, helping establish a church there, and he said this, the elders who are good leaders are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Now, let me clarify. That translation, who are good leaders, though it might be literal, really gives a false impression. What he is saying, the elders who work really hard and they can't make, they're not making money, generally, they're giving full-time to the ministry, either part-time or full-time, they need supplementary income or they need full-time income, make sure that they're cared for. The elders who are good leaders, who rule well, are to be considered worthy of double honor. And that word is, uh, the Greek word gives us uh, basically our English word remuneration. Remuneration. 
especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching, for the Scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain, and the worker is worthy of his wages. And as I was reflecting on that verse, these instructions that Paul gave to Timothy in Ephesus after that church was huge and growing, uh, probably if Paul had lived and wrote another letter to the Cretan churches, he would tell them the same thing because the churches would have grown and would have had a need for more spiritual leaders who devoted full-time to leading those churches. So here we have another very important principle in applying, really, in applying what Paul is talking about in his letter to, uh, to Titus as well as his letter here to Timothy. Now, here's a reflection and response question. How can churches become more faithful in caring for the material needs of those who serve them faithfully. And I've shared this illustration on another occasion, but it happened in one of the churches that I pastored and started the church, and it was growing and expanding. In fact, at one time, we had 17 full-time pastors. That's how large the church was at that moment. But I was uh, observing what was going on among our pastoral staff, and I discovered that for the salaries we were pay paying them, there just wasn't enough money at the end of the month. They weren't complaining, but I found out about the needs that they were experiencing. And uh, so I, I shared this with the elders, and, uh, and what we did is we appointed a group of, of mature believers, a small group of mature believers, who, were, who really would understand the situation. And we said, we need your feedback on the econ economic needs of our staff and our pastor particularly, and what we should be paying them. Now, what we did is we gave this group of mature people the educational background of every one of our pastors. We gave them the number of years of experience they had in the ministry. We gave them job descriptions of everything that these pastors were called upon to do. And then we said, in view of what it takes to meet material needs in this community, and that varies, you know, from different places in the United States. In this culture, in this community, what should we be paying our pastors? And they, they, they took that very seriously. Now, they didn't know what we were paying them. They didn't know what our budget was for paying them. They just simply looked at these areas, and they came back to us with some interesting recommendations. And to our surprise, in some situations, in quite a few situations, they said we should double the salary. Now, they didn't know what the salaries were, but the recommendations doubled the salary. That's why our pastors were in need. That's why they didn't have enough money at the end of the month to even be able to give and share back as they wanted to do. So, now, we couldn't automatically double everybody's salary. It took us three years, but we set out a plan that doubled the salaries in order to be biblical and to take care of those who are ministering to us. So that relates to that question, how can churches become more faithful and caring for the material needs of those who serve them faithfully? We need to really be aware of what the situations are, what the needs are, what the cultural implications are, and we need to stay on top of that through some methodology, and that really worked for us. And it took a big burden off of me because I didn't have to come and say, hey, we should be paying people more. And, uh, and by the way, I was beneficiary, obviously, of their recommendation, which was a real encouragement to us personally. But it took a burden off of me, and the elders were able, with this data, to make some very wise decisions. And by the way, I think in my tenure in pastoring that particular church, we did that three times because economic changes were taking place so fast that we needed input on a regular basis to make sure that we were walking in the will of God. So here's the principle that really grows out of the final statements uh, Paul wrote to Titus. As local church communities were to care for the economic needs of faithful, faithful men and women who have been appointed to service.